<laughs> but the biggest question of all is if you had the choice, really, right, of any face, any gender, anything, why would you call yourself Susan? <laughs> <laughs> Just putting that out there. <laughs> This is a spoiler warning. If you've not yet seen Empress of Mars, then go and have a jolly good old gander, then come back here. This week's guests need no introduction, so I'm not going to do one. It's Empress of Mars writer and Doctor Who superstar Mark Gatiss, and the legend that is Nardole, Matt Lucas. Welcome you lied, to the show. you lied, you just did one. You said we I needed did, no, no I, introduction. Well, it was a small introduction. So, <laughs> so um, well, I've changed my mind anyway. Okay. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on the show. Uh, now, you, you, you've worked together before, haven't you? Many times. <laughs> We met in Edinburgh in 1996. I was yes, 1996. I was thinking that in the uh, shower this yeah. morning. I was wondering as I was soaping <laughs> myself. Very happy memory. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking when which year did we meet? 95 or 96? 1896. 1896 uh, in the Edinburgh Festival, and and uh, we were fans. We became fans of each other's shows, and uh, and then we met. I think in the Pleasant's Courtyard mm. in Edinburgh, and, and um, became friends. Yeah. Amazing. And then we did The Wind in the Willows together. That's right. Directed by Rachel Talalay. Awesome. In Romania in... Uh, 2007, I think. Six, six seven? Six. Six. Like 2006. It was the most austere environment I think I've ever been in. Mm. Um, uh, and the, the toughest shoot I've ever been on. Yeah, yeah. Um, until Doctor Who, until, until we we're, filmed on the, we're trying to get it back so round. Yeah, yeah until we filmed <laughs> on the Brecon Beacons in Doctor <laughs> Who. Oh, so, so what's it like to, to be reunited on Doctor Who? Horrifically, and it, it'll go with me to my grave, the only episode of Doctor Who which I've written, which I've not been able to get to the set to, was Empress of Mars. Oh no! I've always made it for at least a day, couldn't oh. get away. I was filming in Yorkshire. So we didn't meet on on the set. But, but we were, you were there for the read through. I was there for the read through, you're right. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's, everything's yeah. fine now. Yeah. And we see each other, we yeah. see each other socially. socially. We see each other socially, <laughs> socially yeah. don't we? I was at your <laughs> lovely birthday party. My 20th. Yes. Recently. Well, I, I mean, you, you said you, you met in 1897, 26. so looking yeah, good for that's 100 right. and yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. That's time travel for something. you, isn't it? Exactly. Um, no, it's been yeah. lovely. And I think I was thrilled when, uh, when Matt uh, did. Um, uh, the Christmas special, and then wanted to come back. I'm, I'm, I, I love the notion of people saying, "I've had a lovely time. Can I come back?" And I was just very happy to be in something that Mark's written, because yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever been anything you've written before. Wasn't uh, <laughs> invited to appear in the League of Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't cast in Sherlock. Well, there's still time. Well, let's talk Ice Warriors. It's so great to see them back, and with Victorians on Mars. I mean. That's awesome. Yeah, one of those. How did, well, how did this Pete Gatiss script come about? Because <laughs> uh, it is Pete Gatiss. Well, I was uh, I was going to do a sequel to Sleep No More. You'll have to bear with me while I talk. <laughs> no, it's uh, not. Basically, a foreign language. <laughs> no? uh, I wanted to do a sort of Yeti thing of, of doing two stories about the same monster. Uh, and then I thought, well, you know, eras are coming to an end all around us here. You can hear them crashing. And I said to Stephen, can I just do the story I've always wanted to do, which is the Ice Warriors on Mars? And he said, yes. I didn't have a story, that's all I had. Uh, but then I had this idea for the pre-titles, the NASA bit, where the, uh, I've always been interested in astronomy and I love the, the way those, those pictures come back line by line, beamed back because it takes, there's a delay. And I, I said to Steve, what if it says God save the Queen on the surface? That was the beginning of it. And then as I was writing it, it was originally gonna be a, a much more, um, uh, a bit like carrying up the Kyber. It was going to be about a, a Victorian colony on Mars. But actually, I thought it, it wasn't really working. And then I suddenly had this, I realised that what it was was Zulu with Ice Warriors and everything mm. fitted into place. And it's the sort of story I've always loved. I love what they used to call scientific romances. Mm -hmm. uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, sorts of stories like this. Uh, Bank Holiday is what yeah. this is. Ironically, Nardole is off flying the TARDIS for a lot of this episode, so mm. you didn't get to be on screen with the Ice Warriors. But as a fan, what's it like to see no, them? No, but I got to go to Miami. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> While we were filming, because I, <laughs> I had a little break in the filming block. Oh, that's nice. And that's nice. I was while we were filming Once this. Once upon a time, your your absence would have been covered by a filmed insert. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yes. But I got. Um, <laughs> it was freezing cold at the time, 
And we'd been filming in, in caves, uh, the Redland Caves in Bristol, for this. And, um, and, uh, and then suddenly I had a little break uh, because Nardole was off in the TARDIS. So I went to Miami and I was, while we've been filming this series, I've been writing my autobiography. So mm. I went to do some writing um, uh, in sunnier climes. So uh, thank you for writing this episode. <laughs> <laughs> The ice warriors are, are, are a bit odd because on screen they haven't really been that developed as a civilization. So is this something that you've you've always wanted to do? Yes, as I say, mm. it's, I, I've always loved them. I, I think because um, uh, the Curse of Peladon is one of my favourite stories and, and had a big influence on me as a child. I was um, six when it went out, and and I love I love the story. And They've always been, they were like number three, the Daleks, the Sidemen, the Ice Warriors, and they'd only made four appearances before mm. I brought them back for Matt Smith. And I, I just, I think they're a great monster. They're a really cool design and a, it's a good idea. But also what appealed to me was the, was the amount of space around them to invent stuff because there mm -hmm. wasn't much written down. There's not much sort of backstory. So I've had a lot of fun doing that and in introducing the Ice Queen. Yeah, yeah, who is amazing, looks amazing. We've all met a few of those, haven't we, Matthew? Over well, the years. <laughs> present company included. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Empress is, is incredible. I mean, the, uh, what did you think of her design and, and how, how she turned out in the end? I was thrilled. I mean, you know, over the years, uh, sometimes what you, what you write down can be interpreted, uh, sort of interpreted in a lot of odd ways and sometimes it just completely yeah. clicks and uh, at the at the read through actually they, they had a millennium had a, a, a sort of clay maquette and they said what do you think about this i went it's absolutely perfect <laughs> uh really great design yeah, yeah, yeah. um and uh yeah i think i think it's come off very well yeah she's so cool and mars looks incredible as well is this uh, I, I presume this is partially on location and par partially on, on, on mars on set. Yes. yeah on, on <laughs> Well, we actually filmed on Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. it's, a good, it's a good sort uh, of double for Mars. Mars. Yeah. In fact, there's only one place on Jupiter that looks like Mars. Which, and we oh always got it. there. Well, <laughs> bloody, bloody Game of Thrones were there this year. So, so we were on Jupiter. Uh, it's, well, it's in those caves in Bristol and yeah. then in the studio. And then in the studio as well, yeah. So I was in the caves um, feeling quite claustrophobic. Mm. And you know where we filmed is where people actually used to keep slaves. Really? Yeah. Wow. In Bristol. Wow. In Bristol, yeah. And you had those spacesuits on as well, so I'm sure that added to... Well, it's, it's interesting. In, in um, Oxygen, we wore very, very heavy spacesuits. Mm. And we requested, is there any way that the, the next time we wear spacesuits that, that we can just be... That, that, is there any way that they can be a bit lighter to wear? Mm. And so actually, the spacesuits that we wore mm. for this episode uh, were a lot more comfortable. But the helmets, the, I remember when we were wearing the helmets, it's a, it's a strange thing because you can't hear each other very well. So you have earpieces um, mm. in so that you can hear each other, but you're hearing what's over the radio. So in the, in the run up to filming, you can just sort of hear each other humming, <laughs> singing, all the small talk just gets beamed through your ear. It's quite Oh, that's it's quite, quite funny. It's quite funny. And then um, cab drivers. And cab drivers <laughs> and the police. Um, oh dear. But you can't, you couldn't, sometimes the earpiece would fall out of my ear during a take. And there's obviously, I can't, I've got these gloves on, I've got the helmet on. And then the, even though there were tiny fans inside the helmet, uh, they would, the, 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 the glass would still steam up. Did the tiny fans say it wasn't as good as it used to be? <laughs> <laughs> they said, oh God, not an odd doll. <laughs> Ruin the show. Um, uh, so I couldn't hear, I couldn't, couldn't see. Your, and then we yeah. had little lights inside the helmets and they would shine into your eyes. So I was kind of deaf and blind for <laughs> oh, no. those scenes that we did in Mars. Oh. And I could just, just about no memory of it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is that it was very disorientating to be in those caves because they're all over the place. We're well, going back to the Ice Warriors. We've got a, a lovely, lovely new, new take on the, the Sonic weapon which turns them into like footballs, <laughs> like sort of like, how did this come about? <laughs> oh, well, the, in the original stories, they used to do this great, very cool effect with a lovely sound. And what they'd do is they'd, uh, the, the person who was being hit by the ice warrior's sonic weapon, 
they, they'd shoot a reflection on a piece of reflective foil and basically someone would just poke it behind. So the image goes like, it sort of yeah. distorts. I was like that. So I thought I wanted to do something kind of uh, more 21st century with that. So they still have sonic weapons, but it's sort of, they're like, um, like they've been compressed in a car compressor. Yeah. So they, I, I wrote it, there's like origami. They kind of, you can just hear their bones cracking and they kind of go... And it does this lovely tumbling thing <laughs> full of uniform and hands. It's horrible. It's absolutely yeah. horrific. It's just, I don't know, part, it's just a bit sadistic, but I'm, I kind of want to just play football. With one of the, they look like foam. Look, we've got, <laughs> we've got a, like... a tarnished lava lamp. I think <laughs> the football's made out of dead Victorian soldiers of uh, only a day oh away. Oh dear, oh dear. Guys, Alpha Centauri makes an appearance. Yes! Mark, talk us through this. <laughs> They're all Greek to Matthew. <laughs> He doesn't know what, he oh, might as well, we might as well be talking Alpha Centaurian. <laughs> it's lovely to get out the house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't underestimate the pleasure of that. You follow this. Yes, dear. This is interesting. <laughs> yes, dear. The first, Curse of Peladon with the Ice Warriors, 1972. Oh, lovely. Is about Peladon joining the Galactic Federation. And it is a very gentle satire about Britain joining the common market. And by... Extraordinary coincidence, into my lap fell the coincidence of writing an Ice Warrior story as we leave. And originally I did think maybe this is a third Peladon story about Peladon pulling out. Um, but it now survives only as a joke. The Doctor says that this is the beginning of the Ice War, the Martian Golden Age and the Galactic Federation. Everything goes fine until the planet Peladon decides to take back control. So there's a little reference to it. Uh, which has survived. But part of that is the reappearance of this wonderful uh, alien called Alpha Centauri, uh, who is essentially uh, a hermaphrodite hexapod, a gigantic green eye, an eye in a, a bulbous thing, which has a, I'm being very careful, has a little kind of curtain <laughs> cloak on it because it originally didn't. And Barry Letts, the producer, turned up on the set and went, what does that look like? <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> so they put a curtain gotcha. around it. Uh, it's a marvellous thing. And it was voiced by a wonderful actress called Yuzan Churchman, who was, the, the, who was Grace Archer in The Archers, the one right. that they killed off to, to spoil ITV's opening night. Uh, she's still with us. And amazingly, at the age of 92, I think, has done a, a new voice oh, brilliant. <laughs> for Alpha Centauri. So there's a little bit at the end when the Martians make contact with the rest of the universe and the first alien civilization they talk to is come and rescue them is Alpha Centauri. So I, my work is done. I can now go to bed. <laughs> Let's talk about Nardole because, you know, whilst he is a little bit absent in this episode, he has made such a huge impact on the show. Um, and it's so great, uh, uh, you know, to have a comedy partner, I think, for the Doctor. Um, now at the read-through for The Return of Doctor Mysterio, I said that Nardole felt like an anti-companion, always trying to get home to the TARDIS. Uh, and I think this has sort of continued into Series 10. Um, what do you think? Do you agree that Nardo is a kind of anti-companion? I think it's an interesting thing because he he has a job. Mm. And part of his job, part of his role is to be subservient to the Doctor. And, you know, and he calls him Sir because he's like a valet. But he also isn't afraid to challenge the Doctor. And he's been around for a while as well. And so a lot of what's happening isn't new to him. Mm. Um, he knows in, in episode one, you know, he knows what Daleks are already. He's had adventures with them. Mm. Um, uh, but it's good. I, I think the thing is, if, if I'm playing the character, it's better for it not to be a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> because other people can do that a hell of a lot better than me. So Peter kept saying this thing to me during filming. He, he kept saying... Yeah, yeah, I've watched The Rushes. I definitely believe you're an alien. <laughs> and, and, um, Can I ask a question? Is, is that his only name, like Lulu? Or well, is, <laughs> the, is it his first name? Or It's a good question. I asked... Um, is it like John Nardole? Or? Well, I asked Steve Moffat about this. Um, or Moffat. Moffat. I asked the Moffat about this. And somebody pointed out to me on Twitter that Nardole was an anagram of Leonard. And so I said to Stephen, oh, well done. I didn't realise it was an anagram of Leonard. And Stephen said, oh, nor did I. <laughs> so um, I don't know the rest of Nardole's name. Yeah. Nardole Lucas. <laughs> don't know. No. It's good Matthew run. Nardole. It's good yeah. run for years. Yeah. I wonder if he picked his name. 
he chose it himself. It's possible. Yeah, like the doctor. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting thing because people ask me questions about the character and I sort of want to make stuff up, but I realise it's not in my <laughs> gift to do that because I didn't create the character. So you'd have to ask, ask the Moffat. You've had different faces though, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. This is Time Lord as well. This isn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't Nardole's original face. Um, I mean, who would choose this? <laughs> oh. uh, this was one that he bought quite cheaply. Oh. Which scares me, by the way, because as soon as I read that in the script, I'm like, oh, I Can't better re behave. Recast. <laughs> yeah, I better behave because well, I'll, exactly. because I'll <laughs> tune in one year and Nardole will be, be back. someone else. Yeah, played yeah. by uh, Killian Murphy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, fun, fun fact, Nardo is one of the very few people to solo pilot the TARDIS. I just think that's, that's quite fun. Yeah, which I think irritated Peter. <laughs> Some fans get very irritated when they see someone oh, other they, than the Doctor pilot the yeah. TARDIS. But never <laughs> underestimate the pleasure I get by the irritation of fans. <laughs> Didn't, what about Nyssa? Did Nyssa pilot it? Ah, there we go. One of the only, as you yeah, said. One, one but of the you, you and Sarah are in a few. very exclusive place. That's right. <laughs> one of the very few. That's right. But in real life, Peter gets a bit antsy when you're doing stuff around the TARDIS. He doesn't, <laughs> genuinely yeah, doesn't. Does. Yeah, he just, he's wrong. a bit, he's a little bit <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah, can you just put that back where it was? And he sort <gasps> right. of goes oh, he's and he's over it. Oh, no. Yeah, that's where they all are. Oh, exactly. No. Um, we spoke to Jamie Matheson a few weeks ago on the show um, about Nardo and about uh, some of our favourite lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, every line that we brought up, Jamie said, oh, no, uh, Matt Lucas improvised that. So how much of Nardole is Matt Lucas? Um, well, well uh, I did improvise some lines, um, uh, sometimes to the consternation of some people, but I did. <laughs> and I, I just always thought, well, throw them in on alternative takes and, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, and the, the ground people in charge can decide in the edit what they want. Mm. Um, because again, it's that thing, isn't it, of like, well, there's lots of things I can't really do. I'm not, you know, there's things I'm not that good at. So the things that I can do, I might as well do. Mm. You know, I'm not, I can't really, I mean, yeah, there's some lines like, uh, what was it, some of my best friends are bluish. Yeah, I yeah. threw in and there's a few little things and I, I wasn't supposed to join the cuddle at the end <laughs> of... Uh, I was going to say, that is my favourite. I think so far that's my, one of my favourite At the end of Oxygen. Moments. But I did, I, I, I proposed it. But you know what was in my mind then was actually a thing that David Walliams did. Um, do you remember David? Uh, he was. And, uh, um, uh, he did this thing at the Cruise of the Gods, where he in in this thing he did with Steve Coogan, Rob Bride, and James Corden, where he lingers and then joins the hug. And I just I nicked it off him. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's a few things. There was one thing that I improvised as well in Oxygen, which I was I was quite glad that they used, which was. Um, well, I've, I'm sure it's probably an old gag that someone else has done, but it just felt funny in the moment was when I uh, put the helmet on and go, <sighs> and then polish the outside. <laughs> and it's a blink and you miss it, but yeah, I just yeah. did it in a take. And, and again, I think you have to trust the process, which is that sometimes I'll throw those things in on, you know, take three or take four, yeah. because they will get into the edit and they'll do lots of different cuts and they'll figure out what works. I mean, all the writers all wrote really funny things for Nardal. Yeah. But it's interesting to know how to do them. There's a little bit in this episode where um, the Doctor sends Nardal back when Bill has fallen. And um, I say, uh, oh, can't you go? I'll only, I'll only get distracted or something like that. Looking through the sock, sock drawer. drawer yeah. That's it. Oh, can you go? I'll only get. And, and actually, when we were originally doing it, I was going, you go. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you do it. I was like, oh, don't get distracted. Like that. And it was only till a later take that I thought, oh, no, actually, maybe that's a bit too mm. um, sort of grumpy and a bit too moody. Uh, the difficult, the genuinely difficult thing is, I find across the board, is, is that you don't want to like put in brackets like this. Yeah, yeah. But the, there is a genuine danger if you're not there that the, 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 the intention of the thing can mm. be totally misinterpreted. Uh, yeah, like I, that I moment, mean, yeah, I, it was only I, later on that I thought, it's, actually, there's a more charming way of doing this. It's very interesting, mm. though, because you absolutely way. don't want to be so prescriptive, or, but, but actually, in the end, yeah. it can be very difficult. It's weird, because I'm committing lines to memory, not knowing what Peter and Pearl are doing, so I don't know how I'm going to do the lines. So when you arrive, it's just generally people are, are still building things on the set and fixing lighting and stuff like that. 
and you have a very short period of time when you can actually rehearse the scene. And uh, you you don't you have to make decisions mm. yourself. It's really in the and moment. Run with them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, quibbles about Captain Jack aside, Doctor Who has just got uh, its first openly gay companion. Um, why do you think representation like this is important? It's a difficult this because, I, as Stephen said, you know, this, it shouldn't be an issue, uh, but of course it it is because um, because people still want to make it an issue. I'm, I'm, I'm rather heartened by the fact that there hasn't been some sort of ludicrous campaign or anything like that. It's it's just, um, it's again, it's reflecting people's real lives and the, mm -hmm. the, the proper diaspora that everyone lives in. I think it's, but it's it's one of the things that a show like Doctor Who can do so well is, is to present things as perfectly uh, ordinary. You know, the, the, uh, and Russell used to do this so brilliantly, just the, the casualness of, of, of uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lovely uh, elderly gay couple in, in gridlock, I think. It's just a casual thing. And that's, that's the way to do it. So the fact that the bill sexuality is sort of mentioned very quickly and not a thing, mm. you know. Uh, and also there's something lovely about, the, the doctor doesn't really understand the difference between... <laughs> It's, it's like doesn't. wearing a different shirt. He doesn't really understand why people have any problem with it. So yeah. you're kind of, you're both you're both showing uh, a world the way you want it to be, where everyone is really cool about it, but also a sort of a, a sort of further version where it's not even like. Well, time lords are above it, really. They're, they're, they're above gender and race and sexuality. They they just you well, know, we just have things just, to do. They've got, they're too busy. <laughs> well, we've got worlds to save. <laughs> exactly. You exactly. say, are you a Time Lord? <gasps> now, Nardle, uh, I have to say, hasn't really done a good job so far of keeping uh, <laughs> keeping the Doctor at the vault. And now Missy is flying the TARDIS. Well, so the Doctor is ungovernable. <laughs> I mean, don't blame Nardole. I mean, how on earth I mean, it, can anyone... <laughs> I mean, nobody yeah, has ever true. been able to corral the doctor. No, you cannot marshal him. You cannot. The doctor is a law unto itself. I yeah. say itself because I don't. I'm not going with gender <laughs> when it comes to the doctor. Correct. The thing is, if the doctor focused on the job he had in hand, then together with Nardole, they could manage this situation. Mm -hmm. But you, you, doctor is not only fighting whatever's inside the vault, which we know by now. But I'm still going. No, to I. Do you know what? It's actually underneath Missy is the missing episodes of Fury from the Deep. Right. That's what I, I've got excited about. <laughs> that said, uh, it's not going to end, end well, is it? Like, at the end of the series, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall to pieces, isn't Don't it? Don't look at me. No spoilers <laughs> here. <laughs> um, what was it like to work with Michelle Gomez? Well, she's uh, a maverick. Mm -hmm. so, You're a so, maverick, Gomez. Yeah. You say that to across a desk. Yeah. <laughs> You were a maverick. You'll never rise right, on this one force. one more chance, Gomez, yeah. and you're out. That's it. That's why you haven't made sergeant yet. <laughs> um, she, she's a maverick, so you yeah. really don't know what's coming. Yeah. And so it just keeps you on your toes. Well, she's a bit of an improviser as well. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. And so yeah. you just, you don't know what she's going to do on this take, on that take. So actually, in the last couple of episodes, I improvised a lot less because it was... I felt like this is her An time. Her space. Well, no, no, but I felt like it's a big deal having yeah. her there. It's her, it's her, I mean, she has come out and said that that's, you know, that she feels that, that her character is so uniquely identified with Peter's character that she won't be returning is what she has said. So working, working alongside that is the idea that this is the last we see of Missy. And I felt, and I don't mean, sort of grandly doing this but I felt like that this was her turn and I'd had a lot of fun mm. mucking about so actually it's important to kind of go well all right, I've had my moments and step back a little bit and and let her play but it was a great thing to watch it was a great thing to witness and you know um I, we laughed all day all day Aww. we laughed together and mucked about and bounced off each other and I'd long been a fan of her work on TV and then to work with her was just, it was just a pleasure. It really was. Oh. Well, we look forward to seeing uh, where things go in the next, next few episodes. Uh, thank you so much both. And uh, it's that time of week again. Roll Sting. 
So this is Top of the Locks, where we measure the ups and downs of hair in who. Uh, we've got episodes along the bottom and intensity along the side. Uh, so guys, what do you think? And also, I should mention that uh, we're filming the show out of order. So uh, we're jumping ahead to episode nine. It's all timey wimey, wibbly wobbly. Just ignore it. Ignore it. Um, so well, guys, we filmed them out of order. We filmed, yes. We filmed the actual we episodes out of order. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's just like Doctor Who, actual Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, but before we start, actually, um, since we've got you here today, Matt, what do you think of your, you know, your progress so far? Well, I'm, so <laughs> so why am I at the why am I the most intense well, at, the, at so the beginning? Our first our first episode was Stephen and Pearl, and yeah. they said that you had the best hair because you've got invisible hair. Now my, my question is, what what's what is your hairstyle? I haven't got invisible hair. My hair grows inwards. Ah, Ugh. <laughs> that's a story. Mm. So I, I have a very hairy. Let me brain. look in your mouth. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Hair mouth. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go bold. I'm going to yeah. go straight in. Right. Yeah. Michelle has got dreadlocks, and she, which is it's a new look for Missy. Yeah. No so man, I'm going to put her pretty high, but. I want Matt to rise above that. Bless you. Aww. But <laughs> Iraxa has Ice Warrior dreadlocks. This is true. So she's going <gasps> to... Oh, that's our highest. That is our, that is our most intense so far. It is pretty intense hair. What's uh, wow. Ice hair. Well, Bill's hair, she's wearing the helmet, isn't she, for a lot of the episode. So you can't see a lot of it. <laughs> so Bill's going down there. Now, uh, PCAP... Here is a man who, they give you, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes um, for makeup and hair. And he, he has no makeup. He uses it all for hair. <laughs> so, well, now so we know. That's pretty, the truth <laughs> is out there. Yeah. So um, this, is, this is tricky because you've taken the top spot. <laughs> you, so, could knock, <laughs> you could knock the sea out of locks and go like, like break through. I wonder if it sticks to there. Wow. No, it doesn't. So, well, I think I'm going to just be obtuse then and oh, put it down there. Oh, no. And that's, that is purely to wind up. Well, you're getting them back, really. Peacap, yeah. yeah. It's purely to wind up uh, Peter Capaldilly. <laughs> Capalidi. Is, is... Was Peter Capalidi? <laughs> I don't know. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, actually. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll be thank chatting you. about the Eaters of Light. Oh, I'm in that. <gasps> Excellent. Can't wait. To see a preview of the Eaters of Light, click here. And to subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel, click here. We'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>